would you please turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus? We're going to look at chapter 23. So we're jumping back into our walk, uh, walk through Exodus, our journey through Exodus this morning. And we're going to be looking at chapter 23 this morning. Um, as I think about this chapter, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it juxtaposed to, to a video that, that hit the web and, and went viral um, on yesterday. And it was a... Um, it was a a U.S. soldier who was who was um, in a confrontation uh, with 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 police, and it was gut wrenching. It was difficult to watch and view. Um, it it's still being fleshed out in terms of all the details, but as I watch it, I'm again longing for the day where there will be no ambiguity regarding what justice is in our world. That justice will just be clear and decisive, that God will rule and God will reign and he will rule and he will reign with clarity. The arguments will cease, the back and forth discussions about, you know, who's right, who's wrong will cease. We will just have clear demonstrations of justice in our world. And one of, the, one of the things that gives me an appetite for such crave, or gives me an appetite for that, for that type of justice is in this book. Exodus spends a lot of time laying out what does a just society look like? In particular, what does the just society of God look like? How do the people of God define and, and work and strive towards justice? And, and, and we've, we've actually navigated several chapters in the, in the last couple of weeks that kind of highlight what does it mean to live in relationship with one another? What does it mean to live in a society with one another? How do we pursue justice together? And here is a, here is a text in which we see, the, or the final text in which we're going to deal with in Exodus that really kind of brings it all home, so to speak. There's a couple of ways in which I believe the Lord is laying out in his law a manner in which we should pursue justice. How do we pursue it as a community and a household of faith? One way is that we fight for truth. We fight for truth. We fight for truth in a dishonest world. Another way is that we be willing to stand alone if necessary. Another way is that we love those who despise us. And then finally, the the last way in which I'm going to focus on this morning is that we serve the needy. We serve the needy. We fight for truth. We be willing to stand alone if necessary. We love those who despise us, and we serve the needy. The first thing we see in this chapter, chapter 23, if, you, if you're there with me, is that justice is a matter of truth-telling. In verse 1, it says, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be... Uh, to be a malicious witness. Now, as we discussed a few weeks back, bearing false witness is more than just saying that something is factually untrue. Bearing false witness is more than, than just simply getting the, getting the facts wrong. It is about performing truth acts, as we talked about several weeks ago when we were walking through the Ten Commandments together. The example that we used uh, was from a pastor scholar by the name of Tim Keller, and, and he used this example to point to the fact that we can be factually accurate and still not be truthful. He used this example of, about, of a bank robber who, um, or a bank robbery that happens, and there's a witness present, and that witness is factually accurate but still performing a false act. The person is a witness to this armed robbery. The robbery takes place at 4 p.m. And he watches a man who he doesn't necessarily like walk out of the bank at 3.59 p.m. He sees the man that ends up being the one that flees the scene walk in at 4 p.m., a one-minute difference. And while he's testifying in the courtroom, they ask him about the man who left at 3.59, and he, they say, hey, is it, was this guy a part of this robbery? And he says, well, I don't know, but I can, what, I can tell you this. He left around four-ish. 
And that was the same exact time as the robbery. I don't know if he was a part of it or not, but that's all I know. Now, that is factually accurate. He did leave around four-ish. But it is a false act. It is not a truth act because we know and the witness knows that when that gentleman left, that's when the robbery commenced. Do you understand that? And so we in a fallen world with our fallen nature oftentimes love to play games like this. We love to play games with the technicalities surrounding truth. We even do it at a personal level, right? There's two brothers there that are, that are um, debating over the final slices of pizza. Or maybe they haven't even had a debate yet. Maybe there's one brother who, who has already eaten his portion, and he says to the other brother, you still hungry? And he knows that he's already e uh, eaten his portion, and he knows that there is still his brother's portion remaining. And his brother says, nah, man, I'm, I'm full, man, I'm full. Later on, that same brother who was full thinks that he can go back and find his portion of pizza, right? But the portion is gone. He asks his brother, hey, what happened to the pizza? His brother responds, well, I ate it. You said you weren't hungry. You see how we play games and technicalities and we, we, deal, we deal in ways that, that, that may, get, may be factually accurate but don't necessarily mean that they are truthful. The idea of spreading a false report means not only sharing things that are technically inaccurate. I hope that's not us, right? I'll pause while we, while we wait on the sirens. I hope nothing's burning down inside. I hope that's not us. All right, so the ideal of sharing something that, of spreading a false report means not necessarily sharing things that are technically inaccurate, but, but, but rather it means sharing things in a way that puts innocent people in guilty lights. So you and your friend, or you and your spouse, you have a falling out. You get into a heated argument, an argument that leaves you divided. Now you're sitting down with someone and you're explaining yourself to this person in terms of what happened. You're recapping the events of the day and how you got into this heated argument to receive some counsel from this person. The question would be at that moment, are you sharing the whole story when you're explaining it to them? Or are you withholding certain pieces that may place you in a negative light? Maybe you told them regarding your spouse that he hates you, but did you tell them he said it after you said you hate him? Maybe you're, 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 telling, maybe you're telling them about the, 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 the fact that, that, well, she said that I didn't need to buy anything. She's, she's trying to govern how I spend. But did you tell them that she said you didn't need to buy anything else after you went out and purchased a new motorcycle without discussing it with her? Those facts matter. And you can be technically accurate but still false and bear false report. In fact, the first statement in verse 1 is a warning against gossip, and, and this is how most gossip works. When you talk about spreading false reports, this is how false reports work, not always with clearly inaccurate information, but sometimes with just deceptive half-truths and pieces of information that cast the object of the gospel, and a, a, a gossip, into a negative light. Now, the second statement in verse 1 points more paints more of a picture of a courtroom proceeding and gets to the heart of why many people perform these false acts. Verse 23, or chapter 23, verse 1, you shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. They're trying to help people escape accountability in their wickedness and in their wicked acts. You see, justice and righteousness, fam, can't be established in environments where this is normal, where this is, where this is habitual. Half-truths get to, get to get my way. Giving wicked people room to skate by as long as it suits my interests. 
We shouldn't be surprised at the unbelievable levels of brokenness in our, in our politics, in our denominations, in our, in our churches, and even in our homes when you consider that this is how so many play the game. One theologian rightly highlights three ways in which this kind of living, this kind of posture towards the truth can damage us. The first way is, is that it, it confuses the observers. It can influence what people think about an individual so that they would relate differently to that individual than otherwise had they received the whole truth. Another way that it can damage us is that it can destroy the innocent. It can serve as the basis for improperly arresting and or bringing to trial someone who was actually innocent or someone who was less responsible for the situation or crime than would rise to a, a prosecutable level. And then the last way he says that it can damage us is that it, it can divide the people. It can create fact factions as one group believes the report about the member of the other group and vice versa. And the person's own group determined that the report had to have been started by the other group and back and forth we go. When we're not living in the truth, we confuse people. When we're not living in the truth, we destroy the innocent. When we're not living in the truth, we divide people. You see, truth telling is, a, is an oxygen for righteousness and justice. You want to see injustice, you want to see unrighteousness flourish? Create a space where you're not just playing games or where you're playing games with the facts. That's how injustice and unrighteousness flourishes. Create a space where you're not working to be truthful in the sense of speaking truth and acting in truth. You know, when I think about the racial reconciliation movement that's been going on for the last 30 years, one of the things we haven't spent enough time on in the last 30 years is establishing what is the actual truth that led us to our divisions. We spend a lot of time about talking about uniting, but we spend very little time about trying to figure out what is it that actually divided us. Can we even agree on the source of the division? And part of our inability to actually agree on those factors lead to us having so much strain and stress in the effort of reconciliation. Folks, truth matters in the pursuit of justice, in the pursuit of unity, in the pursuit of reconciliation. Brian Stevenson, a Christian, uh, a Christian author and public interest lawyer and even the, the, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and the author of the book Just Mercy, he once said this when asked about the connection between truth and reconciliation. He says, I, I think we all want reconciliation. We want peace. We want understanding. We want redemption. All of these wonderful things, but we haven't committed ourselves to truth-telling. Truth and reconciliation are not simultaneous. They are sequential. Tell the truth first. And it's the truth that motivates you to understand what, will take, what it will take to recover, repair, endure, and to reconcile, end quote. Tell the truth first, he says. Truth is part of the foundations of justice. In order for us to be the kind of people where righteousness flourishes inside our walls as God designs, and in order for us to be the kind of people that can serve as an example to the world outside of our walls as God desires, we must be a people that are wholly committed to fighting for truth. What else do we need? We need to fight for truth, but we also need to stand alone if necessary. Verse 2, it says in chapter 23, You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. There are two ways that the crowd is depicted here. First way is actually doing injustice. Another way is bearing false witness to side with the many who are doing injustice. You know, in order to truly understand justice, you must also understand that the pursuit of it sometimes leads you to stand in solidarity with the masses, but oftentimes 
it leads you to stand in solidarity with the few. You know, we live in a culture that is pulling us in two directions. There's a crowd on one side, and on that side, everything that the other side does is obviously wrong. And then there's a crowd on the other side, and on that side, the, the, everything that the other side does is obviously wrong. But I truly believe where most of the justice is, is in the, is in the minority who refuses to take either side. The minority that is willing to speak truth as loudly to the camp they're closest to as they are the camp that they are farthest from. The minority that is willing to affirm when one side is right and when that same side misses it. When we yearn, saints, for the favor of our peers or for the favor of our sides over the commendations of our God, we will remain silent in the face of unrighteousness from our side. Phil Riken, one of the, a pastor theologian, and Kent Hughes, another pastor theologian, have this to say about this particular passage in verse 2 and verse 3. He says this, this is the law to remember when everyone at school is making fun of the kid that nobody likes or in college when everyone wants to go out drinking on Friday night. It is the law to remember when your company is cheating or when everyone on the board wants to approve something immoral. These are only the pressures we face from our peers. Add to them all the pressures we face from the culture around us. What does the crowd tell us? It tells us to get as much as we can, to prize outward beauty more than inward piety, to go ahead and gratify our sinful desires and not to let ourselves be inconvenienced by other people's needs. Before we know it, we are not only dressing the way other people dress and buying what other people buy, but thinking the way they think and doing what they do. But God has called us to be different. He says, do not follow the crowd in doing what is wrong. You belong to Jesus and you need to follow him. Sometimes in doing so, it will leave you alone. There are times that neither side offers the preferred pathway. There are times when you have to walk alone. You know, when we think about those who have gone before us in, our old, in our old, the Old Testament heroes of the faith, those who stood for righteousness and, judge, and justice. We invest an awful lot of time dwelling on their triumphs. Daniel, for example, Joseph, Moses. But we spend so little time dwelling on the fact that many of these people stood alone at times and stood alone longer than maybe they even got a chance to see the victory after their loneliness. You see, before Daniel was rescued from the lion's den, Daniel was in a lion's den by himself. He stood alone and he refused to bow to the king and worship, and for that, he was placed in a lion's den. Before Joseph stood second in command in Egypt, rescuing them from years-long famine, he stood alone and sold into slavery by his, by his own brothers and incarcerated on false sexual assault charges. He stood alone. Before Moses was victorious in delivering the children out of Israel, or the children of Israel out of bondage, he was alone in the wilderness, banished from the kingdom he was raised in. Because he tried to step in to defend his own kin. You see, we have to be willing to stand alone in righteousness to enjoy the eventual blessing of righteousness. Whether that blessing comes in this life or the next life. Notice something else about verse 3. Or, or verse 2 and 3. In order to paint the picture of standing alone, and forsaking the crowds, the Lord even lays a commandment not to be partial to the poor man. When the poor man is wrong, the poor man must be held accountable. You can't say to yourself, we will always defend the poor man. No matter what the poor man does, he will be defended. No, the poor man has to be held accountable too. 
But verse 6 says, you shall not pervert the justice due to the poor in his lawsuit, meaning that when the rich man needs to be held accountable, when the well-off man or woman needs to be held accountable, then they must be held accountable too. Again, sometimes justice requires that we stand on neither side. Sometimes justice requires that we stand alone. Also, justice requires that we love those who despise us. Verse 4 and 5, it says this, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under his burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. picture being painted here is the ideal of something happening and because the, because the thing that's happening is happening to a person that I do not care for or possibly doesn't care for me, then the temptation arises for me to say, that ain't my problem. Whose donkey is that? Marvin's donkey? Really don't like Marvin. Hope he finds it. Hope he finds it. Whose donkey's laying down? Who, whose donkey can't, can't seem to get up? Gloria's donkey? Really don't like Gloria either. Hope they can figure that out. Hope they can pick that donkey up and get it, get it going. Lord says, no, 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 no. Even though that is your enemy, even though that person has no love for you, even though maybe you might not necessarily care for them, serve them, love them. what they might deserve versus what we choose to give is what the Lord is calling us to. Saints of God, justice requires mercy in order to flourish. Justice requires mercy in order to flourish. A system or a people or a church that is only filled with vengeance leaves no room for justice. The cycle of vengeance has to cease at some point. When I watch what's happening in our city, children shooting one another, seems like every week we're, you know, in such a small town like ours, we're having reports of kids and shootouts. What do you, what do you think is at the root of that? Well, one, kid shoots a, one kid shoots one kid, and then that kid's camp says, well, we can't let that happen. So then they retaliate, and then another kid says, or the other kid's camp says, we can't let that happen, so they retaliate, and back and forth and back and forth, or some kid feels slighted, and so he has to take vengeance in his own hands. It's a cycle of vengeance that feels that, that these youth, that these young men feel like they have to take matters in their own hands. It's a system absent of mercy. But one of the beautiful things that we learn about, uh, about justice is found in the civil rights movement. How did we even get to where we are today? Where we could coexist in the same space and, and work together and go to school together and grow together and, and, of course, painfully do so, but nevertheless even get to a place where we could do it. Well, in large part it happened because of a group of people who decided to stop the cycle of vengeance to say we wouldn't return violence with, uh, we would return violence with violence, but rather grace, mercy, peace, love. And so it must happen in the kingdom of God. If we, if we think that justice is just us lashing out at one another in our churches, well, because brother so-and-so said something to me or sister so-and-so said something to me, so I reserve the right to retaliate. If we think we're going to ever be a just people pursuing that course of action, we are sadly mistaken. The cycle of vengeance has to cease. If you ever think your home is going to be a home of peace by constant retaliation one after the other, if you ever think that your circle of friends is going to be a circle of refuge for you, by constant retaliation, one after the other, you are sadly mistaken. The cycle of vengeance has to cease. 
in order for there to be true peace, in order for there to be justice, in order for there to be unity. You heard the Lord say in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? What makes us kingdom people? The ability to love those who despise us. If we retaliate just like everybody else retaliates, that's not kingdom. That's just average. That's just being human beings in this society. What makes you kingdom is the ability to cease the cycle of vengeance. The kingdom at every level is about exchanging mercy for vengeance, love for retaliation. Whether it's at your personal relationships, whether it's at corporate relationships, whether it's denominational relationships, the kingdom of heaven at every level is about exchanging mercy for vengeance. How else do, how else do we promote justice in our society, in our world, in our church? Serve the needy. From this text, we're reminded that God's law also charges us to serve well those who have been overlooked and those who have been neglected. To practice justice is to consider how the neglected among you are viewed and how the neglected among you are treated. And this neglected includes the poor, and this neglected includes the widow, this neglected includes the orphan, this neglected includes the foreigner, this neglected includes the unborn. Brian Stevenson, again, has, has words for us in this regard. He says, quote, you ultimately judge the civility of a society not by how it treats the rich, the powerful, the protected, and the highly esteemed, but how it treats the poor, the disfavored, and the disadvantaged, end quote. As the Lord is forging a path for Israel to be a just people, the Lord points to this in several ways. Chapter 22, for example, if you look at chapter 22, verses 21 through 27, he says, you shall not wrong a sojourner, a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you lend money to any of my people, Verse, skipping down to verse 25, if you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to them, and you shall not exact interest from him. What is God saying? He's saying don't take advantage of those that are in need. Don't exploit those that are in need. Do not wrong those that are in need based on some preconceived notion of them deserving the wronging. Don't see those that are in need as opportunities for quick gain. In other words, don't play on their desperation. Many of our systems are literally built to play on the desperation of the needy. Payday lending literally is, is a system built on desperation. Raises interest rates to auto, uh, astronomical figures because of the desperation people feel in needing money immediately with no other place to turn to receive it. Now, of course, there's been great, great efforts to reform that system. But understand where that system comes from. It comes from a desperate, preying on desperation. But you don't have to look at the systemic and the corporate to think about desperation. You can look at the personal. You can look at the everyday. You can look at the local. You can look at us. You can look when we go and we hire refugee and immigrant workers and we refuse to pay them fair wages because we know of their fear or the fear that they carry of their status in this country. You can, look at the, you can look at this type of exploitation at a personal level, paying poor people pennies on the dollar, 
of what their work is actually value because we know that they're desperate enough to accept the work. Brothers and sisters, we'll work for food should not be an invitation to pay less than a fair wage for whatever work the person does. Let me share something with you. When you are cutting checks, you are representing Jesus in the cutting of those checks. When you place tips in tip jars, they are saying, what is Jesus? How has Jesus impacted and shaped that brother or sister's life? that just placed the tip in the tip jar with their city light bracelet on. When you are tipping at the end of a day, tipping a waiter or a server, you are representing Jesus. You are the hands and feet of Jesus leaving that tip behind. We must treat the fatherless child. We must treat the husbandless widow. We must treat the struggling foreigner. We must treat the moneyless poor with the same dignity as we treat all people. Otherwise, he himself will, have, will confront us and deal with us according to Exodus. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 23, it says, If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. We see instances of this in the Old Testament where the Lord announces judgment on those who exploit the neglected. One such place is Amos chapter 2. In Amos chapter 2, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel for three crimes, even four, because they sell a righteous person for silver and a needy person for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the poor on the dust of the ground and obstruct the path of the needy. A man and his father have sexual relations with the same girl, profaning my holy name. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken as collateral. And in the house of their God, they drink wine obtained through fines. Notice the Lord's indictments here in verses 6 and 7. He says, Israel is collectively exploiting needy and desperate people. However, what's striking in verse 6 is the final indictment that the Lord gives to Israel. They are now worshiping God with the fruit of their exploitation. He says, they are laying, spreading out garments around the altar which they gained by exploiting the needy. And they are drinking wine in the, in the house of God from the fines that they exacted on, on the needy unfairly. God says this conduct brings judgment. We hear it again in verse 7 of chapter 3. It says, it says in, in verse 7, Keep far from a false charge, and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. Saints, God shows his regard for the neglected by showing not only his justice or judgment towards those that exploit them, but he also shows his regard for the needy by showing how passionate, or, or rather by showing how how to weave their care into the very fabric of Israel's way of life. So he shows us through his judgment, says, I'm coming for you if you treat them harshly. But then he also shows us by weaving how we care for them into the very fabric of life. We've already read a number of ways in which he does that, but also one last way that I want to point you to is verse 10. He says, for six years, chapter 23, verse 10, for six years you shall sow your land and gather in, its, it gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave the beast of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. This is a fascinating passage. Because it's talking about this ideal that Sabbath extends not just to the days, but Sabbath extends to the years. And Sabbath extends not just to your daily, uh, to, your, to your body of rest, but Sabbath extends even to the fields that God is giving you to rest. 
He says there should be a period of time. Tyrone would call it a plant shutdown. There should be a period of time where, where things have to cease and that a period of rest has to begin. Elizabeth would call it a plant shutdown too. I forgot Elizabeth is over that Grand Gulf. But things have to cease. Things have to stop. And so in the fields, every seventh year, there must be a pause. Are you tracking with that? Now, what is the pause used for? Is the pause used for, for your rest? Yes. Is the pause used for the field's rest? Yes. But what, is, what else is the pause used for? The pause is used to care for the needy. And so literally within the very fabric of the way of life for Israel is ingrained a commitment to care for the people who have less. God is saying in this, in this institution or in this instituted command or in this, in this command, God is saying the poor must be prioritized. The poor must be cared for. The needy must be served. Saints of God, is that a way of life in which we are seeking to incorporate in our own lives? Is that a principle that we've adopted as a part of our Christian duty and Christian responsibility? To serve the needy, to serve the neglected, to serve the overlooked. Where is the root of all of this in closing? Where is the root of this justice? Where is the root of fighting for truth and standing alone if, you, if necessary and loving our enemies and serving needy? Where is the root of all of this? Well, the first place we can find it is in verse 9. It says, you must not oppress a resident alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be a resident alien because you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. What is he saying? He's saying you were once needy. You were once neglected. You were once overlooked. And I came and I sought to you, or I sought, sought after you, and I served you, and I provided you with what you needed. We ourselves were once needy. We ourselves are still needy. And yet the Lord daily sees after us. The Lord daily provides for us. If you say, well, I don't need that much physically, well, think spiritually. You have nothing to offer in the way of your salvation. You are needy. And the Lord has sought to it that you would be provided for through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so he says, out of your identity as a needy person, Respond in kind and pursue justice for those that are in need. The second root is in verse 13. Verse 13, chapter 23 says, Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. So he says all of this to establish his way, and then he kind of puts a linchpin on it in verse 13 by saying, okay, everything that I've said to you, pay attention, make no mention of the names of other gods, and, not, and, and don't let other gods' names be on your lips. What is he saying? He's saying that I have called you to a unique way of living, a way that is exclusively mine. Don't be, don't be drawn into this other pattern of living that all of these other gods in this world will present to you. God has called us out to be different. God has called us out to deal with our neighbors in, in, in this manner and upholding righteousness in this way. And this is what it means to be obedient to God. These standards cut against the natural bend of our hearts, don't, it? don't they? You're going to be tempted to follow the crowd. You're, you're going to be tempted to pay back those who mistreat you. You're going to be tempted to neglect the needy around you by telling yourself that they probably don't deserve it anyway. But God is saying, this is what it means to walk with me. This is what it means to call me your God. 
to follow my statutes and my commandments. The last root, first root, we were the needy. We are the needy. Second root, this is what it means to obey God. This is a unique God who's called us out to a different standard. Last root, because our Savior embodied justice in this way. Our Savior not only fought for truth, our Savior is true. He was truthful in every way. He was the very embodiment of truth. Our Savior was willing to stand alone. At the moment of the cross, he was abandoned and deserted in order to complete the mission assigned by the Father. Our Savior loved those who despised us because our Savior loved us when we despised him. At the moment of the cross, Jesus hung there and did good for those who meant him harm. He brought forgiveness to the guilty while the guilty punished him in his innocence. As he, as he hung there, he declared, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then lastly, our Savior served the needy. In fact, our Savior said as he, uh, in Mark chapter 2, verse 15, as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the, of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Our God served the needy. Our God loved those who despised him. Our God told the truth and fought for truth. And our God stood alone when no one else would stand with him. So we can pursue justice in this manner because we have a God that we serve, a Savior who has saved us, that has pursued justice on our behalf in this way. Let us pray. God, we love you.